Good afternoon. Welcome to this week's segment of Watching Washington. Today is Friday, October 7th. My name is Gabriella Chu, and here's what's happening in Washington. Hurricane Ian has done severe damage to Florida's largest cities, from Fort Myers to Orlando to Jacksonville. These areas are among the most populous in Florida, and they will be crucial in Florida's race for governor this November. Last week, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis briefed the media on the hurricane's expected impacts on those areas. Right now, if you look in central Florida, you're looking at potential major flooding in Orange and Seminole counties, uh, St. John's River, all the way up potentially into, into Northeast Florida and Jacksonville. The amount of water that's been rising and will likely continue to rise today, even as the storm is passing, uh, is basically a 500 year flood event. Last week, the Tampa Bay Times reported that when Hurricane Michael made landfall on Florida in 2018, at least 64 polling sites closed down and voter turnout decreased by at least seven percentage points. As a reminder, Election Day is on Tuesday, November 8th, just over one month away. President Biden and the First Lady Jill Biden visited Florida this week to survey the damage. They also visited the city pond in Puerto Rico on Monday. He announced a relief aid of $60 million to help the U.S. territory recover from not only Hurricane Fiona, but Hurricane Maria as well. He also promised every bit of help from the federal government to rebuild the territory faster than before. Ahead of trip, the White House announced that the territory would get a fund of $60 million for preparing for future storms. The administration removed restrictions on federal aid that President Trump had placed during his presidency. The short-term government funding bill passed Friday, which will keep the government running until mid-December. The bill passed by a 72 to 25 vote in the Senate and a 230 to 201 vote in the House. C-SPAN interviewed Representative Fred Keller on why he pledged to vote no. Uh, this bill, because when we take a look at what's happened, we've had plenty of time to fund the government and do the right thing by creating a budget that has the input of every person's representative and every state senator. And what, what we've seen going on here, passing trillions of dollars of spending up to this point without input from both sides and, and to just do this, what we should have been working on for a very long period of time is how we responsibly fund our government and spend the taxpayer dollars that come into the treasury. The bill includes $12 billion in aid to Ukraine, $2.5 billion in disaster aid to New Mexico and other states, though not Florida, and a five-year reauthorization of FDA user fees, among other items. The U.S. Supreme Court returned on Monday to officially open a second term. This new term will bring even more potential hot-button issues to the court's last term and the overturning of Roe v. Wade. This term, issues like the Voting Rights Act, the 1978 Indian Child Welfare Act, and some civil rights laws could be up for discussion. The turmoil of the court's previous term caused approval ratings to plummet to historic lows. Chief John Roberts sought to defend the court's legitimacy while speaking to a conference of judges and lawyers in Colorado back in September. The court has always decided controversial cases. Uh, the decisions have always been subject to uh, intense criticism, um, and that is uh, entirely appropriate. Um, uh, that citizens feel free to criticize uh, our opinions and how we do our work. Uh, but lately, the criticism is phrased in terms of, you know, because of these opinions, it calls into question the legitimacy of the court. Um, and I think it's a mistake to view uh, uh, those criticisms in that light. Justice Alana Kagan pointedly disagreed with what some of Roberts said, noting that in her view, a court's legitimacy has to be earned. A new poll from last week was released by IndiePolitics.org, and it shows the Indiana Senate race is extremely close. Incumbent Republican Todd Young is leading with low majority of 39%. This poll shows his main competitor to be Democratic nominee, 
Mayor Tom McDermott of Hammond, Indiana. The remaining percent of votes is 6% leaning towards Libertarian James Scenic and 17% of voters still undecided. Young is underperforming in his own party, getting just 76% of the Republican vote. This poll surveyed 600 likely voters, but this shows that typically red state, that this typically red state should be watched very closely as election day nears. More than 4 million people will be excluded from student loan relief that was issued by the Biden administration on September 29th. This comes as a shock to a lot of borrowers as the change came quietly. Both Perkins loans and the federal family education loans will not be qualified under this loan forgiveness. A controversial topic just became more controversial as so many people are left out. It shows a lack of preparation of Biden's detail and that leaves a lot of people unhappy moving forward. The average amount each borrower owes in the U.S. is nearly $30,000. There are over $1.75 trillion owed in the loans. So this redacted forgiveness shocks many. Former President Jimmy Carter celebrated his 98th birthday Saturday. Mr. Carter spent his day surrounded by family members and friends in his hometown of Plains, Georgia, where he returned after office. After leaving Washington, Carter spent decades promoting human rights and democracy around the world, winning the Nobel Peace Prize in 2002. Carter, who left the White House in 1981 after one term, has lived longer than any other U.S. president. According to NBC News, President Joe Biden told Reverend Al Sharpton his plans to run again. This happened at the White House in a private conversation, leaving many questions in place. In 2020, Joe Biden became the oldest president in history. His, cam his campaign team presented Joe Biden as a transition figure to take the presidency from Donald Trump and pass it down to another Democrat. However, this delay in announcing his plans for the 2024 election leaves a question mark and shows hesitation in a position that can't show any weakness. This could have major implications in the midterm election and Joe Biden's confidence in the Democratic nominees. How will this soft announcement impact these elections? We will be following the polls closely to see if there are any drastic changes. That's all for this week's segment of Watching Washington. Moving next, we have an interview with Dr. Katherine Brownell. The host for this week is Ellie Acra. Ellie? Thanks, Gabriella. My name is Ellie Acra, and I am joined today by Dr. Katherine Brownell, history professor here at Purdue University. Dr. Brownell, welcome. We're so glad to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. So in your research, you focus on the intersection of politics, media, and pop culture. What got you interested in that area of research? I actually came to that, the topic when I was an undergraduate studying history at the University of Michigan. And it was the time that Jon Stewart was becoming more and more influential in how people talked about politics. And when I went on to graduate school, I became really interested in what role did entertainment play in how people think about politics, how people engage in it, how they understand candidates and the political process more broadly. And so I started looking into it and I found that there actually wasn't any historical scholarship on the role of entertainment and how it's used to communicate, to inspire activism and encourage turnout, to raise money, which is a key factor. And so I really began digging deep. I thought maybe I would start, or maybe it started with Ronald Reagan, but actually I found that he was a culmination of a change in cultural values, political parties, and technological developments that was really six decades in the making. So over the years, um, starting with even before President Reagan, you've seen that evolve. Um, in the past decade, how have you seen that change with the emergence of social media and new technology too? Yeah, so anytime new technology comes in, there's an opportunity. In many ways, it can be very democratizing. It can open up the media landscape to new voices. But what I've found through my research is that increasingly, it's those that have performative skills that have been able to succeed in some of these new technologies, whether it's radio or motion pictures 
or television or social media today. And that's where Hollywood really had an opening to become involved in the political process, to lend their expertise to political candidates who are struggling to navigate some of these new mediums. So these are some things that you highlight in your book, Showbiz Politics. Um, and could you, as you just touched on, could you expand on a little more how we see the influence of politics in our politicians being coached by Hollywood, or is it something they observe with our change in culture and just pick up on naturally themselves? Yeah, one of the things that was really exciting that I found in my research is that Hollywood entertainers, some of them are studio executives or actors or writers, producers, that they are they really gravitated towards politics because many of them wanted to be taken seriously and their ideas taken seriously. For studio executives, they also wanted to cultivate uh, relationships that could help them economically with tax policies or other regulatory issues. And so they were very eager to assert their expertise to politicians that were willing to listen. Not all politicians wanted the advice of Hollywood entertainers. And there is this persistent idea that thinking about style can distra distract from the substance of a campaign. And so that's a challenge that many entertainers who are politically motivated have really challenged in terms of being taken seriously by candidates and campaigns. Yeah, and I can see that being very evident over the years as I feel like now we tend to see celebrities get a lot more involved mm -hmm. in politics and political movements than they have been in the past. Um, and it seems very evident how that's affected political campaigns mm -hmm. um, and not just that, but also the candidates as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and do you see this as a good or a bad thing? I think we just have to understand the dynamics that are at work. And part of what you see over the 20th century is that in the early 20th century, political parties controlled so much of the process. They selected the candidates, they controlled the platform. It was very much an insider politics game. Hollywood ha helps to open up the process to make it more open to, uh, to voters on the primary trail to perhaps uh, uh, have their say in terms of who will be the nominee. Uh, and it's, it's, it allows other voices to shape political conversations and different candidates to emerge that are not so tied to party politics. Of course, this also makes it more media driven uh, and significantly more expensive as well to run some of these campaigns. And so I think it's important just to understand the shift that happens in terms of how parties work, how elections work and how campaigns are run. And do you have any advice um, as news consumers, how we can make sure um, we're aware of this, but we're also discerning um, the candidate from the sensationalism? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's such an excellent question. And I think that's the key issue that so many of us face today is how to have media literacy to really understand um, the issues. And so I think the key is to look at money, uh, you know, who's funding particular advertisements or initiatives, and, and to think about the who's advising some of these candidates as well and what their agendas may be. And so if you kind of look at behind the scenes of what goes into creating a media message and really thinking about the values they're trying to instill and promote with those messages, that can tell you a lot about the campaign. Yeah, and that's definitely important as people look at midterm elections and presidential elections coming up. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the media is doing a good job of teaching news consumers this? Or how do we convey this information to the everyday American? Mm -hmm. That's, again, another excellent question. And, and I think that overwhelmingly, a lot of news commentary and punditry focus a lot on the process. And, and they want to unpack the, uh, the, the messages, but they don't necessarily encourage viewers to think critically. Mm -hmm. and, and that is exactly what you need to do. It's not just to know that, yes, there's a strategy behind different uh, staged opportunities, uh, but that you really need to think about the what what goes into that strategy and and what what the message is that they're trying to promote through these sensational photo apps, right? And you can actually really break them down and not trust just one media source uh, to get your information about um, these issues as well. Yeah, I think that's definitely helpful as we look to the future of the midterms and American mm -hmm. politics and. As a whole, where do you see this intersection of Hollywood and politics going forward in the American future? 
Well, I think Hollywood traditionally has played a variety of different roles. They have served as advisors. They have served as <clears throat> fundraisers. Um, and I think that is continue as campaigns have become more and more expensive, they've continued to play a central role to raise money. Um, but they've also served as candidates. Uh, they've used their celebrity to propel their political candidacy. And in many ways, using their ce celebrity credentials as a way to legitimize their political aspirations, even if they don't have experience in politics. You can see this with, of course, Donald Trump, but very much uh, it's at play in the midterm elections. We've got a variety of different candidates who are banking on their celebrity appeal to help them win voters. And so I think just understanding that entertainment and celebrity are a part of our political process. So knowing how it functions and what the goals of deploying celebrity are is really important to understanding. Um, the, 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 the deeper dynamics of the campaign. So do you see going forward a lot of politicians or people looking to get into politics capitalizing on this and making use of that Hollywood sensationalism? Well, it's been a part of politics for quite some time, almost mm -hmm. a century. And while it's been very contested, the idea of using new tools to encourage political communication to perhaps shape media narratives um, and get people excited about the political process, that has persisted. Even though it's been incredibly controversial, it can be manipulated uh, for darker purposes, but it still has persisted. Yeah, so even though there can be those negative parts of it, it's a positive thing that it gets more people involved in the political process, as long as we can take that time to think critically, mm -hmm. you believe? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as we go into these midterm elections, um, how do you see it affecting individual races? Are there any big races that you're watching where you think that this celebrity factor is definitely at play? Well, of course, there's the, the senatorial race in, in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. with Dr. Oz, and that has very much been a referendum um, on celebrity and whether or not Dr. Oz has the credentials uh, to run there. And he's very much drawn on his ratings as a justification for why he should run for political office. And so I think that's a key factor. But more broadly, I think midterm elections generally suffer from low turnout. Mm -hmm. And that's actually where Hollywood celebrities could play a role by getting people excited about the issues to raise awareness of particular candidates and their stances and to encourage them to sign up to or register to vote and then actually go vote. And this is something that, again, is a tradition in Hollywood going back to the 1940s when celebrities played a key role in registering people to vote and getting them excited, making them promise that they would turn out to vote then. And, and that's an opportunity for celebrities to influence this election as well. So as we go into these midterms, um, you touched on earlier, making sure that you think critically as you're watching these campaign messages. Do you have any other advice um, for viewers or specifically students um, as they go into the midterm elections and discerning that sensationalism in policy? Mm -hmm. I think the key is to do your research and to not take anything at face value. Look at a variety of different sources. Uh, look not just what journalists or pundits say, but look at what your professors are studying. Look at the, the academic research. There's so much tremendous information to help you navigate what can seem overwhelming in terms of all of the data and the information that's, that's, that people are bombarded with these days. But especially at a university, there are tremendous tools in terms of the research, the scholarly research, and the expertise of faculty. Yeah, and that's something I've never really thought about, but I think it's important for students to hear is that as college students, while we're inundated with all this information from social media, we have such a great opportunity mm -hmm. to speak with people who research in these fields every day. So mm -hmm. I think that was a great bit of wisdom. Um, and thank you for coming on today and sharing all of your advice and thoughts on these issues. We're so glad to have you. Um, and we look forward to hearing about your next set of research. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank mm -hmm. you. We hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Brunel. This is Ellie Acra, and we will see you next week on Watching Washington.
the Center for C-SPAN, which is this organization, the CCSC. What we do is we facilitate like a bunch of organizations, uh, different programs for Brian Lamb, which is the founder of C-SPAN. Anyone can be part of CCSC, whether it be through our various internships, um, our competitions, just to be involved, even like our student community meetings that we have every week. Anyone can go, you don't have to be communications or poli side. You just meet so many people, the connections you make is kind of crazy, the range that CCSC has. So yeah, it's just provided me so many opportunities to like kind of achieve the goals I have personally and forward to like whatever career paths I choose. Football. It's the best time of the year. You know what else is great? The world's largest and fastest mascot. You can't have Purdue football without the trains. Look for the Reamer Club outside Stewart Center, 12 to 5 p.m. on Fridays before home football games, for your chance to ride the Boilermaker Special for free. See you then. Imagine a world where Olympics and Paralympics are unified as one and where all athletes at all levels have equal opportunities to play and perform at their full potential. Athletics has been such an influential and transformative aspect of my life. So to me, RISE is about ensuring that every person that has the desire to participate in sport has the opportunity to do so. This organization is about recognition. We believe in recognizing excellence where it is found, especially in Paralympic sports. RISE is about driving change in our community and beyond. We hope that through our events and initiatives, we can galvanize people for our cause and inspire them to create an ever-growing network to help achieve our mission. It's about connecting people of various backgrounds and who truly care about creating meaningful change together. We develop projects and hold events to bring people together at the interface of inclusivity, sports, and engineering. Our goal is to promote the equality of all sports and to improve sports performance and accessibility. Join us so that you can have a major contribution in creating meaningful change. What does it take to be a Purdue tour guide? You've got to know your history. You have to know your facts. You've got to have that Purdue spirit. And you have to walk backwards. Hi there, my name is Vikram Jaithluk and I'm the founder and president of the Purdue chapter of the University Blood Initiative. Over the past two years, we've been able to collect over 300 pints of blood to be donated to local hospitals and you can be the next one to help out. I donate my blood at the University Blood Initiative. Hi, I just donated blood through the University Blood Initiative. Hi, I just donated blood through the University Blood Initiative at Purdue. Right, I donated my blood through the University Blood Initiative at Purdue. And I donated my blood at University Blood Initiative at Purdue. Are you looking for a new hobby? Or do you want to have a fun evening with your friends? then come climb to new heights at the Co-Rec Climbing Wall. Well, one of my favorite parts about being in the band is the homecoming parade we do every year. We all wear lights and the audience just loves it. They get, they, they just crowd the streets and they, the kids love it. Their faces are just lit up and I just love providing that entertainment for everyone.
we start usually like four hours before the game with our pre with our inspection where they make sure we have all our uniform parts and then rehearsal and then we get to hang out as a section the saxophones have some fun traditions while we have our section tailgate we usually play what we call sax polka a lot of different songs we just start playing and everyone else loves hearing us i've gotten a lot of compliments on our pre-show stuff Anyone can join the All-American Marching Band. We have a bunch of different factors within it. Um, one of them is obviously if you can play an instrument, you can be one of the marchers or players in the band. Um, if you can twirl a flag, you can be in our color guard. If you can do a baton, you can be one of the twirlers. Um, and we also have a dance team. So our whole organization is around 400 people big. And that's with all the different factions. I really like all the traditions we have and some of the um, choreography and they all, all of the traditions make band more fun and like make us unique from everyone else that I just think our band is, has, is very special compared to all the other college bands. We've been a team since 1980, so my father founded the team back then, which was before I was born. And uh, we've been competing ever since in the IHSA, which is the Intercollegiate Horse Show Association. We actually have levels all the way from walk trot, which anybody can learn how to walk and trot a horse in their first lesson, um, all the way up to open, which is where they're jumping over jumps around three foot in height. So we have kids that have never ever ridden before. We have several international students on the team this year that have never even touched a horse, and yet they're gonna be able to show probably next semester when they have a little more practice under their belt. We have a level for everybody. So we have kids that have literally never seen a horse in their life on the team. It's a really great opportunity for students to learn to ride horses or to get back into riding horses, and it's really wonderful. I'm also a resident assistant, so I'm extremely busy all the time, but I still they still manage to make time to uh, schedule in a lesson for me, which is fantastic, and I absolutely love everything about the team and the people on the team. It is a little expensive for a club at Purdue, but we have to pay for our horses, so it costs right now uh, $400 a semester to be on the team, which seems a little pricey, but for people that are used to riding, that's pretty cheap in the long run. Uh, they get about 10 lessons a semester. So that being said, we're just looking for good team players. We love people who are open because we're a really, really close team and we all like to know each other. So we look for someone who's definitely open to being themselves. Hi, pretty girl. Hello. She's very sweet. It makes me feel like I'm at home because I'm used to going to the barn every single day. And when I came here, I wanted to look for something like that in the equestrian team. And I miss my horse, so this kind of helps. There's, you can make a lot of close friends. It's a nice group of people that friendships can last for a lifetime. Involved in the three-year program at Purdue made it easier to say to myself, I could get done in three years. The three-year program helped save me a ton of money. In not completing my fourth year, I would save around $30,000. It will give you an advantage of anything. Doing the three-year program at Purdue has shown me that I have motivation to do whatever it takes to get my degree. Mm -hmm.